This is lecture 13 on probability. Um, <clears throat> we talked in class about probability in the context of the Monty Hall problem, and one of the things that we said there is that in that your intuitive notion of probability works well, but when it fails, we have no precise language to straighten it out. What we're going to do here is this is a common practice in quantified fields, is we're going to develop a formal, precise language for talking about probability. And at first, it will seem like we're taking obvious things and making them complicated uh, and obtuse. What you will find is that gradually you will see the formal, precise language as saying the same thing as your intuition and being as comfortable to talk about. And then you will find that it does things that your intuition fails at. It extends your intuition. So that's the goal, so you should be patient during the obtuse period. So probability applies to a process that you can repeat as often as you like with potentially different outcomes each time. Rolling a die, flipping a coin. The probability of an event is the proportion of times you expect it to happen in the long run of many tries. Um, that is actually a useful statement to think about probability in complicated situations. It will often disentangle problems in itself, but it is still not very precise because it involves your expectation about the future, in fact about a very fuzzy future, which is some sort of long run of many times trying that, whatever that process is. So where do these expectations come from? There are basically three places. The first we talked about, the Monty Hall problem, the symmetry principle. If there are several indistinguishable or interchangeable possibilities, they must all be equally likely. This is uh, the logic that tells you when you flip a coin, there's no reason why heads should come up more often than tails. Uh, so they're equally likely. They each come up half the time. The empirical principle is the second way you can get expectations, and that's basically saying events will happen with the same frequency that they have in the past. So if in the past one out of every two million commercial airplane flights have crashed, you get on a plane, you're reasonable in assuming your chance of crashing is one in two million. <clears throat> the important point is that both the symmetry principle and the empirical principles are assumptions about how the world works that could be correct or incorrect. In particular, although everyone agrees that the probability of heads when you flip a coin is 50-50, it is actually slightly more often than tails. A famous example was of a uh, statistician who was in prison for most of World War II and apparently spent the entire time flipping a coin and keeping track of it. And he found a little more than half the time it comes up heads. This is because they aren't really interchangeable. Because you're imprinting the heads and tails, their weighting is slightly different. Different amounts and places stick out, which means the coin spends very slightly more of its time with the tail down and the head up. You can exaggerate this effect by spinning it on a tabletop rather than flipping it. Um, likewise, the empirical principle, if airplane safety regulations have changed, or if there's something specific about your flight, which means that the past history should be taken as different, you're in a particularly unsafe airline, uh, then the empirical principle needs to be modified. So each of these is assumptions which may or may not be correct. Finally, there's subjective probability, where the probability just measures how sure you are that something will happen. So if I say I think there's a 40% chance that string theory, which is the current speculative physics theory of everything, is correct. I'm not saying something about out of every 100 universes, 40 of them, string theory will be true. I'm just measuring my certainty quantitatively. Surprisingly, it is possible to do something useful in precise mathematics with those kinds of statements. And they play an important role in Bayesian probability. But that's way beyond what this course covers. Uh, for us, those, that source of probability is so fuzzy as to be of no use. Okay, so those are the situations we can model with probability. What does the model itself look like? 
here's where it gets very formal. A probability model consists of a set called the sample space. The elements of that set are called simple events or outcomes. And the probability model assigns to each outcome a number, which is called its probability, such that each of those numbers is between 0 and 1, and they all add up to 1. That probably did not make a whole lot of sense on its own, but it will become much clearer in examples. The sample space is just the set of all things that can happen each time you do this experiment or process. So if the process is rolling a die, we would model that with a sample space consisting of the six outcomes, the numbers 1 through 6, that can show up. Since they're all equally likely, the symmetry principle tells us that each one has probability 1 6. Then we write it like that, p of 2 equals 1 6, to say 1 6 of the time 2 will come up. We have to check those two properties of the numbers, that they're all between 0 and 1, yes, and that they add up to 1, yes. Okay, another example. When you draw a card from a shuffled deck, now there are 52 possibilities, so the sample space is the 52 cards in the deck. The deck is the sample space, if you like. All the outcomes, again, are equally likely by the symmetry principle. They all come up 1 52nd of the time. And once again, we check that 1 out of 52 is between 0 and 1. And when you add it up 52 times, you get 1. What we're doing here is a little bit subtle. We're distinguishing uh, whether something is a valid probability model, if it is, if it meets these conditions, doesn't matter what physical situation it represents, it's a valid probability model. Everything we do from here on in makes sense in that model. We're separating that question from the question, what does it model? As we saw, you know, if, the, uh, if the die is weighted, then the model we gave for rolling a die with equal probabilities it doesn't represent reality. If the die could sometimes end up on its edge, we've left out one element of the sample space. So it is at least possible that it, your probability model doesn't represent the situations you think it does. It's also possible it represents situations you weren't thinking of. Um, but we're separating that from the question, is it a valid probability model? That involves checking these two assumptions. Here's one more. Um, which doesn't use the symmetry principle. Um, suppose we choose a woman from one of my classes and we ask her party affiliation, then, as we did in the survey, then the sample space consists of the three possible answers, D, I, and R. And empirically, we know that, this is, this is from a previous study, that the probability of that she's a Democrat is 26.1%, probability she's an independent is 30.4, and the probability she's a Republican is 43.5. So that's the percentages of my the women in my class who were in each of these categories. Each of those numbers, remember, a decimal can be thought of, uh, a percentage can be thought of as a decimal by moving the decimal point over to. Each of those probabilities is between 0 and 1, and of course they all add up to 100% or 1. So that's a use of the symmetry principle in a very simple situation. The first most important thing that we will do with probabilities is we'll talk about events. So remember the elements of the sample space were called simple events or outcomes. An event, we'll always use capital letters early in the alphabet, not always, usually, to represent events. An event, A, is a set of outcomes. It's a subset of the sample space. Again, that may be obscure, but in examples, it'll be clear. An event is something that can happen when you do this process. When you roll the die, the number can come up odd. So the event odd is a thing that can be true or false about each time you, you do it. But we're going to think of it not as a statement or a thing that might be true, but as the collection of all outcomes where it's true. So what what is the number showing when it's odd? It's showing a 1, a 3, or a 5. So odd, the event, equals the subset of the sample space 1, 3, 5. Likewise, drawing an ace is an event when you draw a card. It consists of the four aces in the deck. 
We're drawing a heart. It consists of the 13 hearts. Why do we care about events? Because we can talk about the probability of an event is just the sum of the probabilities of the outcomes that make it up. So you're given the probabilities of outcomes. You get probabilities of events by adding them together. And again, this may sound obscure, but it makes perfect sense when you look at examples. The probability that you roll an odd is the sum of the probabilities of the events, simple events that make it up. 1, 6 plus 1, 6 plus 1, 6 is a half probability that you draw an ace is going to be the sum of those four 1 over 52s, which is 1 out of 13. And the probability that you draw a heart is the sum of those 13 1 out of 52s, which is 1 fourth. So all of that's pretty straightforward, and you get the same answer that your intuition would have told you in all those cases. In all those cases, the um, symmetry principle means that all the outcomes were equally likely, and there was a simpler way to say it. So if all the outcomes are equally likely, then you're just counting up how many outcomes are in A and dividing it by how many outcomes are in the sample space. It's just a purely counting thing. Uh, when you use the empirical principle, when your outcomes are not all the same, life is more complicated, but this rule still works. So what's the event? A woman in my class is not a Democrat. That is, that's made up of Republican and Independent. That probability is the probability of Republican plus probability of Independent. I think I may have written them in the wrong order there, which is 63.9%. Uh, it will be helpful to represent events visually, and the best way to do that is a Venn diagram. Venn diagram is a visual representation of sets and their relationships. You've probably seen them before. The idea is each set you want to talk about, you draw a circle. You imagine that the points inside the circle are the elements of the set, and then you can look at things like where they overlap. This is the, and may not surprise you by now, an XKCD cartoon relating the things that are actually on the front page of a university website with the things that people go to the site looking for. And of course, the point is to see the total of that's in the intersection, and I think you can agree that that hits home for those of us at Fairfield. We are going to, all, our, all of our sets will sit inside the sample space, so there's a big oval representing the sample space of all possible outcomes, and any particular event is some circle or oval inside the sample space. And then if you have two events, you can talk about their relationship. So there's a couple of words, because events can be thought of as things that are true or false. There are a few logical connectives that allow us to build more complicated events out of simpler events, and they all correspond to something um, in terms of the sets and visually. So not A. To say that an event doesn't happen is itself an event. It's called the complement. It's the event, event consisting of all outcomes not in A. So all the stuff outside the circle. A and B, which is the intersection, is the event consisting of all outcomes which are in both A and B. It's saying that A is true of your outcome and B is true of your outcome. And visually, it looks like the overlap between the two sets. And a somewhat less common notion is A or B. The union is the event consisting of all outcomes which are either in A or in B or in both. Mathematicians use the inclusive or, which allows both as a possibility. So that ends up looking like that sort of uh, binocular shaped region. So back to our trusty examples. The event not ace is saying you draw a card and it isn't an ace. There are 48 possibilities, right? 48 cards in the deck which are not aces. The event ace and heart. Stop for a moment and think about what, what events qualify, what outcomes qualify as ace and heart, how many there are. The only thing that is both an ace and a heart is the ace of hearts. So there's one possibility. Okay, 
ace or heart would be any card which is either an ace or a heart or both. So again, stop for a moment, do the calculation, and see if you see how many events there are in, how many outcomes there are in ace or heart. Um, there are 13 hearts, there are four aces, but you can't just add them together because that would be counting the ace of hearts twice. So since you double counted it, you have to subtract it off and you get 16. You may have counted it up in a different way, but that's certainly one way to get the number. Okay, I want to talk about how probability relates to end, or, and not. Um, and we're going to do that by uh, What's going to help us in that is Venn diagrams. We want to think of the area of the event as corresponding to the probability. And it turns out, you measure your area, so the sample space is one, that, that's a, that all the rules of probability make sense as rules of area. First off, the complement rule tells you that the probability that A is not true is 1 minus the probability that A is true. Here's the visual picture. The area outside the circle is equal to the total area minus the area inside the circle. Well, it's pretty obvious from an area point of view. It also is pretty clear in examples. Um, in terms of events, the probability of not ace we saw was 48 divided by 52. That's 1 minus the probability that you draw an ace, which is 4 out of 52. The probability that you're not a Republican. That consists of Democrat and Independent, so it's the sum of those two, it's 0.565, which is 1 minus the probability that you are a Re Republican, 435. Okay, the complement rule will be a, a very useful tool to sort of have in your back pocket. Here's why. Sometimes you'll be in a situation where an event is very complicated. If I ask what's the problem, some probability something happens at least once, you have to consider the probability it happens exactly once, and the probability it happens twice, and the probability it happens three times, and so on. But its, it's complement is much simpler. Its complement, if it doesn't happen at least once, then it never happens. And it may be very easy to find the probability that it never happens, and then take one minus it. All right, our second rule tells us how OR works. It's a little more complicated. The probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. That's complicated. The way I think of it is that probability turns OR into plus. That it's almost true that probability of A or B is probability of A plus the probability of B, but we have to fix the error in that by subtracting off A and B. If that's helpful, here's the picture, and it kind of fits that, that logic. That area of the two together is the area of the left-hand circle plus the area of the right-hand circle, but you've counted the middle stuff twice, so you subtract the area in between. My drawing program couldn't handle sheeting that region, so it had to hash it. So here's an example. We saw before that there were 16 cards which were either an ace or a heart. So the probability of ace or heart is 16 out of 52. Does that fit the formula? Well, probability of ace is 4 out of 52. Probability of heart is 13 out of 52. And the probability of ace and heart we saw was 1 out of 52. And sure enough, 4 out of 52 plus 13 out of 52 minus 1 out of 52 is 16 out of 52. And notice we're doing the same calculation arithmetically that we did before. 4 plus 13 minus 1 is 16. Simpler example, the probability that a woman is a Democrat or an Independent we saw was 0.565. Is that equal to the, what the formula says? Probability of Democrats 0.261, Independent is 0.304. And Democrat and Independent is zero, because you can't be both. So yes, those are equal. That last example was particularly simple and the most common use of the sum rule. So we're going to speak about it separately. 
we need a definition, we say two events A and B are disjoint or mutually exclusive if they can't both happen together. That is, if the probability of A and B equals zero, Venn diagrams, that corresponds to the circles not overlapping, there being nothing in the intersection. Um, but the important thing about the notion of disjoint is that you can recognize it from the physical situation. You don't need any math to say it. It is obvious that Democrat and Independent are disjoint because you can't be both. Uh, likewise, it's obvious that heart and spade are disjoint. Um, that Democrat and Independent are disjoint, rolling a one or rolling a two are disjoint. On the other hand, ace and heart are not disjoint because you can be both an ace and a heart. Rolling an even number, rolling a number less than three are not disjoint because you could be a two. Uh, so one thing you will need to do in problems is recognize, ah, these are disjoint events or these aren't. So if events are disjoint, one of the three terms in the sum rule disappears, the a and b, because its probability is zero, and you're left with a very simple sum rule that's called the simple sum rule. The probability of a or b is probability of a plus probability of b. I think of that as probability turning or into plus. This is the most common way we'll use the sum rule, it's important to know when not to do that. Okay, so the probability you draw a heart or a club is just the sum of the two, which is each a quarter, because there's no, because they're disjoint. Probability of drawing an ace or a king or a queen is the sum of their three probabilities because they're disjoint, three thirteenths. Democrat or independent, again, the sum. All right, let's do an example. You probably noticed uh, for example, when we talked about the uh, surveying uh, women and asking their political party, you've probably noticed that we are, there's a strong analogy between events and probabilities and versus categorical variable and counts. And here we're looking at a table that could very well be from chapter three, where we talked about relating to categorical variables. The analogy is very close and we'll make it more precise later, but you should just expect things that we saw there will show up in some form here. So here are my two variables. Um, you know, if you, if you haven't read Harry Potter, I will tell you that everyone is either a wizard or a muggle. You can't be both and you can't be neither. Uh, and so that means that each person can be either a wizard or a muggle, and they can either have two wizard parents, or two muggle parents, or one of each. So here's my survey of 100 people from the Harry Potter world, uh, and I've identified how they fit into each of those categorical variables, but I can also think of them as outcomes. I have the six outcomes here that come from combining what you are and what your parents are. So from this table, we can express all sorts of probabilities. For example, what's the probability someone in the sample is a muggle? You should try pause and try each of these and make sure that you're getting the same answer as me. Well, there are 72 muggles in the sample out of a total of 100, so 72% of them. So if you're drawing someone at random from this sample, 72% are muggles you have a 72% chance of drawing a muggle. Likewise, the empirical rule would suggest that if this is representative, we should expect the next person we see to have a 72% chance of being a muggle. What's the probability someone has muggle parents? 85 muggle parents out of 100 is 85%. Here's a more complicated one. What is the probability someone is a squib? Remember, that means they're a muggle with wizard parents. It's actually not more complicated. In some ways, it's simpler because muggle and wizard parents, this is a conjunction, a, a, sorry, an intersection. Muggle and wizard parents is what we're asking about. And we can see that we see exactly how many there are in the sample. There's one. So we didn't have any fancy rule here. We just used the, used directly the um, 
information in the table, 1 out of 100 or 1 percent. What's the probability someone is a muggle or has wizard parents? There are two ways to do this. So hopefully you can find one of them. See if you can find two. If we use the sum rule, we would say it's the probability of muggle plus the probability of wizard parents minus the probability of muggle and wizard parents. So that's 72%, which we did, plus 10%, minus 1%, which we did, and that's 81%. What's the other? Well, you could just add up all the things that fit that condition. The nine people who are wizard with wizard parents does, the one person who's a muggle with wizard parents does, and so on. The one, the 70, and again, we get 81%. Finally, what's the problem someone has wizard or mixed parents? Again, there are two ways. See if you can find them both. The first way is that they're, because they're disjoint, the sum rule is very simple. It's the probability of wizard parents plus the probability of mixed parents. I guess MP is a little unfortunate since there's mixed and muggle. So that's 10 out of 100 plus 5 out of 100, which is 15%. But a second option is to say it's the complement of having muggle parents. If you have, don't have wizard or mixed parents, you must have muggle parents. So it's 1 minus 0.85. There are often multiple ways to do probability problems. Okay, the last basic notion, the last of our probability rules, is based on a definition. And the definition is two events, A and B, are independent if knowing one is true doesn't make the other more or less likely. I will give you some examples of how you recognize that in physical situations, but the most important thing about this is it corresponds to a symbolic algebraic fact, which is events are independent if and only if the probability of A and B is the product of the probabilities. You can think of this rule, this is called the product rule, um, and you can think of it as analogous to the simple sum rule. The simple sum rule turns or into plus but only if the events are disjoint. The product rule turns AND into multiplication, but only if the events are independent. This gets used both ways. Sometimes you will recognize from the physical situation that the events are or are nearly independent, and that allows you to use the product rule. Sometimes you will recognize from the actual probabilities that events are independent because they follow the product rule, and you get to conclude that they don't have any logical connection to each other. So here are some examples. The events ace and heart are independent. Why? Because if I'm holding up a card and you're supposed to guess whether or not it's an ace, if I tell you it's a heart, I haven't told you anything. The chance is still the one quarter, one thirteenth that it's an ace, right? So knowing one doesn't give you any information about the other. Let's see that the product rule works here. The probability of ace and heart is 1 out of 52. The product of probability of ace and probability of heart is 1 13th times 1 4th, which is, again, 1 out of 52. On the other hand, the events ace and king are not independent. If I tell you the card's a king, the probability that it's an ace goes down. It goes down to zero, right? Um, they're, as fine, they're disjoint, which is as far from independent as you can be. The probability of ace and king is zero, which is certainly not the product of the probabilities of ace and king, which are each one thirteenth. Uh, one more example. If I flip two coins, the probability that the first one comes up head, heads and the probability the second comes up heads are independent. One coin doesn't affect the other. Usually, independence is about one thing not affecting the other, not having an influence on it. They're not being causally related. Uh, and sure enough, the probability that they're both heads is one-fourth. It happens one-fourth of the time, which is the product of the two probabilities. Okay, let's go back to Harry Potter. Again, pause and make sure you've you do it first, and then make sure that we agree. 
What is the probability someone in the sample is a wizard? That's the kind of one thing we've been doing already. 28 out of 100, or 28%. What's the probability someone has wizard parents? 10 out of 100, or 10%. Now, what's the probability someone is a wizard with wizard parents? Again, with here is, if you understand, think about what it means logically. You're saying they're a wizard and they have wizard parents. That's a conjunction. I'm sorry, an intersection. But notice we can't use the product rule unless we know they're independent. That's okay here because we can just count that there are nine wizards with wizard parents, so the probability is 9%. Now we can use those numbers to check independence. Are the events being a wizard and having wizard parents independent? No, because the probability of wizard with wizard parents is 9%, and that's not equal to the probability of wizard times the probability of wizard parents. In fact, it's much bigger, 9% versus 2.8%. But this was obvious, or at least it's obvious if you've read Harry Potter, because in Harry Potter it's clearly implied that there's some kind of genetic connection that wizards are more likely to have wizard children than muggle. Um, that is to say, having wizard parents affects whether or not you're a wizard, makes it more likely. And that's what we're seeing here. The probability that you're a wizard with wizard parents is higher than you'd expect if they were independent. So here you both should not expect them to be independent. You can see a relationship and the calculation shows they're not independent. All right, what we've just done is basic probability. We will, what we want to use probability for will usually involve a sequence of steps. You answer a series of questions. You flip a number of coins. Um, so we need a way to model those sequential situations. And the problem is, that if you count up the sample space, it grows exponentially. So long sequences, it becomes impossible to enumerate the sample space. So we need tools to think about that. Uh, and the main tool we'll use is a tree. We're not going to use this a lot. You should just be, need to be comfortable with it, with it in simple situations. But it's an important conceptual aid. So I'm going to show you in a simple example how a tree works, suppose our sequence of uh, processes, sequence of probability experiments, is a test with three questions. Let's make our life simple and say there are three true-false questions, and let's imagine you're guessing randomly. So you have a 50% chance of being correct and a 50% chance of being wrong, and we can assume that successive answers are independent. Getting one right doesn't increase or decrease your chance of getting the next one right. Here's how we're going to model this situation. We're going to imagine your starting point is a single dot, because there's only one possibility. And now we're going to draw a line out of that for each thing that can happen in the first step. You answer the question. You can either be right or wrong. I wrote right as correct, C. And they, we're going to label each of those edges with its probability, 0.5. So now there are two possibilities, where you are after one question. From each of those, we're going to draw arrows for the possible outcomes in the second step. Okay, again, two possible outcomes, correct or wrong, each probability 0.5, but because we're drawing them out of each of the states you could have been in, there are now four possibilities. And finally, in the third step, we draw it again, and now we've got, you can see this sort of tree on its side look. We have eight endpoints, and they each correspond to the way, a uh, one way the test could have gone. You could have gotten all three correct. You could have gotten the first two correct and the set, last one wrong, and so on. So we've enumerated the possibilities. Um, every final point corresponds to a path from the beginning to the final point. <clears throat> so those eight outcomes correspond to eight paths from the left to the right of this tree. And here's the important point. The probability of each outcome is the product of the probabilities along the way. So the probability of getting all three correct is the probability of that upper path, C, 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 which is the product 
of the three probabilities 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, which is 1 eighth. Getting the first two correct and the third one wrong is also 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 is 1 eighth. In fact, they're all 1 eighth. <clears throat> well, that's not terribly exciting, but now you can ask questions like, what's my chance of getting two right? Well, if you look through, you can see there are three ways to get two right. You can get the first two right, you can get the first and the last one right, you can get the last two right. Uh, these are disjoint, so we can use this simple sum rule. Sorry, this went off the edge of my screen. Um, we add up three probabilities, which are all one eighth, and we find you have a three eighths chance of getting two right. There was a one eighth chance of getting one right, a three eighths chance of getting two right. I'll leave you to think about the other two possibilities. There's also a 3 eighths chance of getting one wrong and a 1 eighth chance of getting all three wrong. So that kind of summarizes all the possibilities. Those numbers we will see later. Um, in that case, the events in sequence were independent. When the events in a sequence are independent, you don't really need the trees. So you can, because those products that we were doing along the edges would, were just the product rule. Here's an example of a sequential problem that you can do without resorting to the cumbersome tree. Suppose there's a third chance of rain each day and different days are independent. What's the chance that it will rain for the junior and the senior prom and the class picnic? You will have a trifecta of high school misery. Well, that's an end. And because they're independent, we can use the product rule. So we multiply the probability of each one, which we're told is one third, and we find there's a one in 27 chance. Here's something you can't use independence for. If I draw two cards in a row from a shuffled deck, what's the probability they will both be aces? Of course, the first one has a probability uh, 1 out of 13 that it will be an ace. But because we've removed a card from the deck, we've changed the probabilities for the second one. Here's where a tree is useful. So we have two possibilities for the first step, ace or not ace. Probability of ace is 4 out of 52, because there are 4 aces and 52 cards. Likewise, the probability of not ace is 48 out of 52. So now we're going to draw lines from each of these um, dots, but now the probabilities are going to be different, right? Because on the upper dot, we've just drawn an ace. So now, assuming we drew the ace, the first time, how many cards are there? How many aces are there? And therefore, what's the probability of drawing an ace? Stop and think about that and give me an answer, and then I then go on. There are now three aces in the deck, and there are 51 cards in the deck. So the probability went down to three out of 51. We lowered the chance. That means that there are 48 out of 51 is the chance that you don't draw an ace. Um, so, in particular, the answer to the original question, what's the probability they're both aces, is the product along that path, 4 out of 52 times 3 out of 51, which is 1 out of 221. Okay, so now you see we've, we've learned how to compute things that you probably could not do by your intuition. Just to, for completeness, we don't need it to answer the question, notice that if we didn't draw an ace, then there are four aces in a deck of 51, and the probability went up. Okay, so you could keep filling in this uh, tree, and you can imagine, for example, uh, thinking through probabilities, it'd be a bit more complicated, for various kinds of poker hands would require this kind of thinking. I want to end with one last example, because it's a wonderful example, and because it indicates where your intuition breaks down. So the question is, if I pick two people in this class, uh, I, I'm sorry, if I ask everyone in this class what their birthday is, what's the chance that two people will have the same birthday? So the answer turns out to be way higher than most people expect. And let's do the calculation. First, there's a trick. This is a case where the complement rule helps. Why? Because to think about 
the probability that any two people in the class have the same birthday. We got to think about the probability that the first two people do, and the first person and the third does, and the seventh and the twelfth does. It's adding up a lot of different possibilities. They're not disjoint, so it becomes extremely complicated. But its complement is really simple. The complement is the probability is they all have different birthdays. And it turns out to be completely tractable to find the probability they all have different birthdays, so we just take one minus that. How do you end up with everybody in the class having a different birthday? Well, the first person says their birthday. The second person says a different birthday. So there's 365 possibilities for the first person, but only 364 for the second. The third person, given that the first two people don't have the same birthday, then the third person has 363 left to choose from, and so on. That's what you need to know to make the tree. The probability that after the first person has said their birthday, there's no match is one. There's no way there could be a match. And we can think of that as saying that the probability is 365 out of 365 because of the 365 different possible answers. The second person has a 364 out of 365 chance of being different. So the product, the chance that both are different is the product of those two. The third person, given that the first two are different, has a 363 out of 365 chance of being different. And that's crucial. The probability is not that if the two happen to have the same birthday, but we don't care about that. We've eliminated that. And now you see the pattern, right? Each additional person, you're going to multiply the top by the next number down and the bottom by 365. So suppose we had a class of 26. We would multiply 26 of those fractions together, which would be on the top, every number from 365 to 340, and on the bottom, 365, 26 times. So in a class of 26 students, the chance that everybody will have a different birthday is 40.2%. The probability at least two have the same birthday is 59.8%. In other words, more than half the time, a class of 26 will have a pair of students with the same birthday. Lower for 20, here's a couple of different examples. For 28, it is around two-thirds. Uh, so it's pretty typical for a typically sized class to have two of the same birthday, to have a, a pair with the same birthday. All right, that was lecture 13. There was quite a bit of content, and let me be very precise about what you should be able to do. After this lecture, you should be able to check something as a probability model. That is, check that each outcome's probability is between 0 and 1, and that they all add up to 1. That's pretty straightforward. You should be able to find the probability of events given a probability model. If I describe the probability model deck of cards and I name an event, you should be able to say what the probability is. A little more complicated, you should be able to use the complement rule, the sum rule, and the simple sum rule, and the product rule in real situations. You should be able to tell me when events are disjoint and when they are independent from a description of the situation. Those are all the basic skills, and that's quite a bit. After processing, you should be able to make and use trees for simple sequential probability models. You should be able to calculate probabilities for sequential probability models when the steps are independent, like the uh, junior problem problem. And you should be able to solve complicated problems that may use several of the probability rules. We'll see those in class.